uh, sessions. It will be a bit about um, just photography and lighting. And I would love to share with you a little bit more about uh, my process. As you all know, um, photography comes in various ways and everybody has their unique way of doing things. So this is just my, uh, what I'm going to share with you essentially is just my way of, of um, uh, doing things. There's no right, there's no wrong, there, there shouldn't be rules to photography, that, that, that I always say. Uh, as much as, you know, there's f-stops and shutter speeds and everything, you know, they are there to literally be broken. All right. Okay, so um, here's something, you know, here's a few slides that I love to talk about photographer psychology. Um, Pre-shoot prep, right? Before a shoot, um, for me, say for example, I have a beauty shoot this afternoon. Before I leave home, what I'll do, I will download, literally download, because my brain is a muscle. My eye is a muscle of sorts, so I'm like a sponge. I literally download. So what I do, I go to my computer, I have a folder that I collect beauty pictures, for example. And that morning before I leave for the studio, I do this. I'm burning stuff in. Beautiful pictures that I collect. I'm a hoarder. I love collecting beautiful pictures, right? I hoard that. So before I leave the studio, I download images. When I get to the studio, the model might do something that kind of leads me down a path that I saw this morning. I saw a particular picture and go, yeah, you know, maybe you should put your hands here and that, and because I saw something similar. And that helps me to warm up, so to speak. Right? Uh, point of view, approach your shoot with a certain eye line. Because models, to me, are plain canvas. I love to um, uh, give them a backstory, a personality per se, so that um, there is a certain sense of purpose where I'm coming from. Right? Uh, say, for example, if I'm shooting eye to eye line, that would be a neutral point of view to me. If I'm shooting low and looking up, I'm, I'm letting the viewer look up towards the model. Or if I'm shooting from top to bottom, I'm making the viewer look down on the model, for example. Or if I'm shooting behind something, uh, that's very voyeuristic. So the point of view is really important. Yeah? Celebrities, they need a lot more atten uh, attention and finesse because I, in the advertising work I do, I work a lot with celebrities and they come with a lot of baggage. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, your personality as a photographer. Be a chameleon. On set, I am a chameleon. I kind of behave differently to different people, primarily because I don't have much time to get to know them sometimes. So I would kind of position myself in a way where if somebody's speaking really softly and slowly, I would speak to him or her softly and slowly. I wouldn't go, hey, my name is La La La, and you know, throw the person off. It's my job to come down to a frequency that's comfortable with the people I work, especially with models or celebrities. Uh, and be a cheerleader, right? I rah-rah my, my, my team when I'm on set. And to me, being on set, because I work on big sets, uh, it's a bit like where I am now on stage. Um, Clients hire you and I, I'm sort of performing in front of them. Uh, sometimes I put on a show. I could have lit the set in 15 minutes, but I, you know, I take all the lights out. I bring, bring in all kinds of stuff, make it look like there's production value. And you know, they would see, oh, it's, you know, oh, this production is so amazing. Yeah, money well spent, so to speak. Right? Uh, and always be ready to change tactics. Yeah, and because anything can happen. I, I have a plan E, you know, B is never enough, and be flexible with everything. On set behavior, always show confidence, never show weakness. That's something I always do because creatives, clients, they are so, so sensitive, right? A little bit of um, not sure and so on and so forth, they pick up on it, and what's going to happen for the rest of the day? They're going to be right up your ass. They're going to literally go, yeah, you sure you got that? La, la, la. And I cannot do my work. You know, I will always have to portray confidence. Even though I don't know what I'm doing, I have to 
think I know what I'm doing, or at least show that, you know. Um, be in control, your mood affects everyone on set. That's, that's obvious, right? I can't expect uh, my model to jump and be happy on a happy shoot when I'm you know, just going, yup, jump, be happy, right? I mean, that's not gonna work. I, I have to work B as much uh, to give the energy, etc. Or if it's a very you know, somber shoot, I will then wind myself down. It's a play, okay? Shooting behavior. Uh, that's something that you will see me do. Uh, speaking clearly and projecting your voice, right? Shooting with a, shooting with a, with the cameras today. Most cameras obviously have the whole back, and you were talking when you're shooting, right? Or you are, or you have a model drive below. You'll be talking into your camera. The model, or person in front of you, is going to hear a muffled voice. And what's going to happen with a muffled voice? She's going to go, "Sorry, what did you say?" And what's a, and, and that happens. She's act, he or she is activating all the negative muscles on her face. On her face. Oops, sorry. Okay. And when that happens, she goes, sorry, what? And then you say, smile. Oh, okay. Try frowning and smiling back to back. Try that. It's hard. And it activates all the wrong muscles. So the picture you're going to get would be a very awkward picture from a muscle standpoint. You know what I mean? So always project your voice. Sorry. Project your voice top out and clear. You know what I mean? Yeah? So that's kind of important because when the model's confident and clear about what he or she understands, she can give you just bam, 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 you know, expressions of expressions. And obviously always direct in his or her direction, right? You go, look left, look right. I never go, look left, right? It's my job. I'm the professional. I'm the professional here. Of course, I'm working with professional models, but I'm the photographer, so I should take the responsibility of moving things left and right. And only one voice, and always inform of your actions. In a sense, when I'm shooting, I love to always tell my model what's happening, right? If I'm shooting, I go, okay, just give me a second, I'm focusing, right? So what happens? When the model is behind the camera, she's waiting for you to focus. She doesn't go, is he done yet? Is he, is he going to shoot? When is he going to shoot? You know? And, and that becomes psychologically something that happens in a, in a, in a model's head, obviously. You know? So you say, yeah, I'm focusing, just give me a minute, she can relax. And then she'll give you the smile and not hold the smile that goes still after a minute. You know what I mean? Yeah? Okay, so I always inform of my actions. Later you will see, I love to even count down. So I go one, two, or not. Sometimes I don't count down, and I'll explain that why. Later. Okay, one voice on set, and obviously that's the photographers. You know, I have stylists, I have clients who occasionally like to butt in and tell the model what to do. Not a very good thing, obviously, just too many things going, a lot of pulling. So you want to have one clear voice. And especially with today's photography, you tether to a laptop. Everybody can see what you're shooting. Everybody will have a say, right? So many a times I would either shut my screen off so that nobody can see, they will only see after I'm done shooting, or I'll position the client far away on an external monitor so you know, they don't get to come close to me when I'm working so that we get a clear channel. There's a certain flow on set. All right, and regulate the speed and volume of your voice to, 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 to get a certain response. Self-control, never show your temper you get what you project, right? I've never ever shown temper uh, on set. Why? Because I think I'm a professional. They hire me to get the job done. It's always, always about the image, always. Ego is the worst thing to have on set. And meetings, do your research of who you're meeting, right? So that you could, I mean, you know, today's social media, you can kind of, you know, oh, yeah, you had uh, a football yesterday or something, <laughs> you know, so you could, it's a bit creepy sometimes, so watch it. <laughs> okay, and dress the part, obviously, yeah, to look professional, and have a mixed bag of ideas. I always have in my laptop when I go for meetings a lot of different uh, ideas that I'm ready to throw into the mix if my ideas are shot down. Always, always have. So, cool psychology. 
right? <laughs> Photoshop is amazing. It's the, it's the most amazing tool, and um, it should be that way. You should get things done in camera, because when you get things done in camera, take it into Photoshop, you can do magic, I always say. But if you do a you know, half-baked image that's not done in camera, you have to do so much saving in Photoshop. You're just, you know, you're just not doing yourself any good. You should have the best possible image in camera. Then you will do magic. I always believe magic in Photoshop. Communication. Always brief the crew. Things on set should happen magically. I brief my crew before anybody comes in because I don't want to be giving too much instructions on set. Right? Things just happen magically on my set. Um, Clients feel a certain, because there's a lot of directions already on a shoot. So I'm trying to minimize that with my crew. Directions should be only with my models, my talents, and my uh, clients and the creatives. And obviously, they can boost you up on your bad days. Now, I'm human. I have my bad days. So tell them, and they will you know, bring you up. And I always excite them. Push and pull. Always allow the crew to take initiative collaborate with them as partners, and throwing people into deep end. I love doing that. <laughs> I love to throw people in the deep end and see how they sink or swim. Yeah? And then it's my job to you know, save them and give them, and, and it's a learning process, because that's how I learn. And um, to be honest, that's the best way to learn, uh, to make the mistakes, to make the mistakes. All right, onset discipline. Um, I had a shoot once where the makeup artist, we were shooting a celebrity, and before, we can even start hair and makeup. The, 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 the makeup artist was you know, taking selfies with the celebrity, and I'm like, you know, what the hell's going on? You know, a celebrity came, let her sit down, get makeup on, finish the shoot, do a selfie, but not the very moment she got in. It's just not professional. You know, I need a certain amount of professionalism on my set because I think um, that's the expectation that we have to portray. Yeah. Okay, that's the. Exciting part, model psychology. Experienced models. There's two kinds of models, obviously. Experienced and inexperienced models. With experienced models, they are often very, very well trained in their own body, the way they move, the way they, they, they strike a pose, and there's a lot of anticipation on their part. Right? So what happens is a, mod, a very experienced model will, will give you a pose, and she will hold it down and wait for you to trigger, because she knows that's amazing for you. But as a photographer, that is not what I want. I don't want that pose she gave a um, hundred other photographers before me. I want something else. Right? So I would more often than not break her momentum by triggering faster or slower. These are small little ways that you can do to break her moves, for example. Right? And um, their portfolio. Now, looking at a model's portfolio, be it online, be it in a book, right? what I always do is to look for the most forward-facing face. Or if the model's coming for a live casting, I have her in front of me. What I'll do, I will take my hands, I will do half the face, and then I'll flip and do bottom half, and then I'll flip and I'll do this half, and then I'll flip and I'll do this half. What I do with this little exercise by doing this is... I could literally look and see, look at the symmetry of her face, which is the higher, bigger eye, smaller eye, which is the higher cheekbone, where's the better jawline, left or right, and all these little intricacies on a human face. There will be so often where I will see a face that's fully symmetrical, but more often than not, I would say 90% of models are non-symmetrical, and that's up to you, the photographer, to decide you want to do the left profile or the right profile, so to speak. All right? So that's a, that's a um, really good insight into a model's portfolio. Also, looking at a model's portfolio, you will also notice, for example, some models, you have eight out of 10 pages of her from the right profile. So that says a lot to me. That says a lot. That says all the photographers find her right profile better, which makes me go, hmm, could I see your left profile, please? I might want to do something different, right? Or I might want to join the eight other photographers who shot her right profile. I don't know. 
It's up to you, right? Inexperienced models. Obviously, you need a very, very gentle approach, right? They are inexperienced. You need to guide them. You need to put them at ease with constant assurance. You need to clear the studio if necessary because you know, some of my sets, I have 20, 30, 40 people behind me. And if I have a talent, she might be overwhelmed. Um, it could be her first shoot. So I clear the room, have a little bit more intimacy to just get the stuff done. And I read their body language. Body language is something that I, that I study a lot. I read a lot of books on body language because that's my job, right? I move humans into nice uh, poses. Okay, getting what you want. I play a lot of mind games. Not often, but sometimes. Um, I adopt a persona that will steer the models towards something. It's not a good thing sometimes. Uh, not say not a good thing, but it's a bit manipulative, but it's a fun process nonetheless. I'll just share with you this experience, uh, this shoot that I did. Um, I called up the agency and said, you know, I, w I want a model uh, who would listen, who is somewhat new. And I had my choices, so I chose one of them. And I told them that um, the agency and the, my crew, that today I'm going to be an asshole of a photographer, right? Just because I want to steer her towards a certain emotion. And the agency told her before she came to the studio that, oh, Jeff, uh, whatever photographer, you know, you cannot uh, disappoint him. You have to do everything he says and so on and so forth. So she did just that. She came to the studio. I ignored her uh, all through everything until she sat in front of the camera. And then I went into my, cam in, into my um, camera and looked down. And then I muffled. I mean, I just said something, right? Chin up and she couldn't really listen, okay? And she said, sorry, what? And I went, chin up. Can't you understand, chin up, right? And she was like, okay. So I kept pushing and pushing and pushing because I wanted her to cry, for example. I wanted to break her into a certain, I would rather position her and bring her emotionally into, <laughs> it's awful, kind of, but, but after that, uh, I, you know, I just hugged her and said, you know, I was playing with you. I wanted a, a genuine response. I wanted a genuine expression from you. And, and she said, no. And we, you know, we, we had a nice dinner with the crew. And it was, it was good fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this one, um, I had to make a kid cry. Uh, so I sat with the mum. I figured okay, let's, let's figure out, you know, what's his favorite toy? Should I take away his toy or something, you know? It was for an ad, by the way. Um, so I found out that he loved uh, soft drinks, right? So we just kept feeding him with soft drinks, and I told the mother, at some point, he, he has to pee, right? So yeah, she says, yeah, he has to pee. But, he's, but at the same time, he's a really, really obedient boy. He listens to everything you want, you know? So as I was shooting, I was going, you know, doing some random stuff, right? Just to get him in the mood and everything. So it just kept going and going and keep feeding him drinks to the point he said, uh, Uncle, I need to pee. And I said, nope, stay there. Let's carry on. <laughs> Uncle, I need to pee. Nope, Car carry on. <laughs> Uncle, I need to pee. Nope, stay there. <laughs> Uncle, I need to pee. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we got that with his mother's permission. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Not the right thing, but uh, I had the mother's position, um, uh, permission, and we got our shot in... in <laughs> okay, so, a good photograph is knowing where to stand, isn't it? Yeah? Because we can all go to the same place, we can, and, and we'll all end up shooting very, very different pictures. And so Adams. Okay, so, now is my bit on uh, understanding light. Here we will talk about very quickly about lighting before I get into a demo. The variables in lighting, one, angle. Uh, Eric, if you don't mind, yeah, just play a little bit here. So we obviously have the angle, which is up, down, left, right, yeah? Okay, and we have, oh, that's Eric, by the way. Okay, and then we have the height, up and down, the height. Okay, 
and we have the distance from subject, forward, backwards, and the size of modifier. That's a big five foot octa. Okay? The size, five foot, type octa, softbox, for example. Flash settings, shutter aperture. And your cam. Um, I'm sorry, going back, <laughs> missed that. Uh, flash, flash settings, which is on your head or on your power pack. 1.0, 2.0, 5.0, half power, full power. And camera settings, which is shutter and aperture. Now, the way I work, I do baselining. What's baselining? In a sense, with camera settings, whenever I work, it's always on manual. I never go auto, obviously. Uh, I always know what shutter I want, what aperture. It's fixed, always fixed. I never take an exposure meter because obviously I snap, I can see the result immediately, I can tweak from there. Primarily because taking readings off an exposure meter, you will be wasting a lot of flashes, right? Not the greenest thing. Um, also, um, you will kill the lifespan of your, of, your, of your flash tube. So I take a shot, I look at it, and then I dial up and down. So what I do with all my flash is I do a baseline, which is 5.0, or your middle mark. Whatever, whatever light you use, right, middle. On a pro photo, it's 5.0, for example, because then you have the whole range of minus and the whole range of plus, plus 5 and minus 5. It's up to 10, okay? So from there, wherever I place my lights, near, far, behind, on top, everything's on 5.0 do one master shot, I've got a baseline. Everything's 5.0, and then I'll just be a conductor. Okay, I will very simply go, all right, that one, 5.0, let's go 7.0. That one, hmm, looking at the computer, oh, I need it a little bit brighter. Let's go 8.0, and then that one's too bright, I'll bring it down, 3.0, and then I do another shot. And then I fine tune in the next two or three shots, I'm done, right? It's kind of straightforward, and it's very good for having uh, a set with a lot of lights. Because when you have a lot of lights, it compounds, and it can get really messy really fast, right? Okay, so after baselining, you count backwards. Camera settings, fixed, always fixed for me. F16, 125, for example. That's my favorite, F16. I love things sharp. Then I go to my flash settings, 5.0 everything. Then my type of modifier. What kind of modifier I want to use? A softbox, okay? The size, what's the size? You want a three, five, whatever. How many foot softbox you want? And then the distance, where do you place your light? How far, how near? Nearer you go with a softbox, the softer it gets. The further away you go, if I take this softbox, I put it across the road from this building, if I have enough juice, I fire, it will not be a softbox anymore. It will be a pretty hard light by the time it reaches over here, technically, right? So with light, that's how, there's a rule of thumb, by the way. Closer, softer, further, harder. Height, how high, and the angle of light. Feathering, direct, bounce, etc. So these are the seven or well, eight. <laughs> Jeff Wu <Roo> of photography. <laughs> okay, so breaking the light. I love to create light that just doesn't look like what the manufacturer intends, so to speak, right? A softbox will give you a soft light, sure. But I like to break that softbox. I like to create shadows. I like to create textures and layers to the light because just walk outside. Light's never so consistently even wherever you go, right? There's always a shadow. There's always something. There's always a, a bounce off a building, off a glass, of something that would kind of create that layered look. And our eyes are just so much more attuned to that. It's more accepting. Right? The minute you have a softbox, you shoot, 
it will look like a studio picture. I, I kind of not sometimes want my pictures to look like a studio picture, so to speak. So take, you know, take a step from uh, you know, a page from the old days, obviously. You look at, you look at the, I'm sorry. Uh, where is it? There. Oh, do you have it here? Oh, OK. You see, the, uh, your eye is drawn to this area of the, of the painting. Immediately, squint your eyes. It draws you. Everything else falls into secondary. And then after finishing what he wants you to look at, you start to reveal everything else in the picture. So it's kind of nice to create that vignette with your light, to just draw the eyes. Obviously, you can do it with Photoshop and Lightroom and everything else, but like I said, in camera, baby. Okay. Um, for example, this one, your eye is drawn to, squint your eyes, right? If you squint your eyes, you can see you're drawn to the face, then the ring, it's a jewelry shoot. This sculpts the face uh, with that really strong line. It, it, although her face is that wide, with that line across, it just forces you and gives you a really sharp look, a very edgy look to the picture, okay? Same thing here, all right? Here, you get to see some shade on this side and on this side, right? Primarily because light and you know, inverse square law, right? What's closer is brighter, okay? So if you have a light source, obviously this side of the face is gonna be brighter. So you want a feather or you want to break it so that you get a nice wrap, a nice exposure across. And sculpting, sculpting of light, a certain direction of light coming across. I, tend to like to shoot um, from the mid-tone or from the shadow. That would give a very sculptural light. So my highlight is always away from me. I'm never, most of my advertising shoots that I do or my lifestyle kind of shoots, I'm very seldom standing where the highlight is, which means where if my light, if I'm here, my light's never beside me. That's standing in the highlight. I position myself in the mid-tone or in the shadow and then I shoot in. That will create a very sculpted light that gives a more 3D effect, for example. Here, you will see, again, right? It comes from here, and it starts to gradate down. It's a really nice, soft look to the picture. As well here, very, very sculptural. You can see all the shapes in the face. It's not flat. All right. And using colors, using colors, gels, paper, colored paper, to create a certain color because when, okay, the color temperature coming out of one softbox is, let's say, 5,000 Kelvin. You have another softbox coming down from the bottom. It's also going to give you 5,000, for example. Gel it a shade different, a, a, a tint different, like a bluish gel or a warmish gel, just to throw the color temperature off. What happens? You get one accurate color temperature, you get one cooler temperature, right? Take it to Photoshop, you start to play with the S curve, what's gonna happen? You're gonna reveal a third color where the two colors blend, right? That's what you see here. Where is it? I'm oh, sorry. That's what you see here. You see the, all this, all this Transition of colors happens in a very interesting and organic way when you have colors, right? And the, the wardrobe as well, the way you position your wardrobe, the light, how it falls, you can shade off so that the wardrobe doesn't over shine and take away from the face. It's all about the face. Okay, so. Here is a setup I did for just that previous shot, okay? So, which is a, uh, something similar that we have today without the ring flash. That, 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 that bit over here, this bit over here, that's a ring flash, which we don't have today, but we do have the same softbox. And I use a lot of cutters. You can see over there, that whole lineup, those are cutters. The Americans call it flags. They are used to be placed in between lights to cut light, to break light, so to speak, so that we can texturize the light, 
right? Okay, so I use it a lot. So you can see here, there's two cutters, one on top, one on top here, and one here. That's to break the softbox, so I get um, the light to go exactly where I want, which is the face, right? Okay, and the ring flash is just a really, really soft uh, pop just to get into the meat tones so that I get a nice definition in the, in the skin. Right? As simple as that, just one soft box and a couple of cutters, I could create very textured light, so to speak. Yeah? All right. uh, tennis balls are very convenient. Buy some, cut them up, and then uh, there's, a, there's a little hole. You can put them over sharp things that stick out in the studio. You won't hurt yourself, and it's colorful. Yep, so we make them like little Pac-Man Pac by cutting a line there. All right, let's shoot. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? <laughs> let's keep it very casual and uh, I hope I'm not boring you. And <laughs> okay, super. Let's uh, bring on our models. We have Emma and Josh. Yeah, cool. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, let's uh, let's have um, Josh first. Remember, if you could take a seat somewhere at the side. Ah, that, that's a chair there. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So I'm tethered to Lightroom now. Um, I always shoot RAW, but today I'm going JPEG so that I can shoot faster. It loads faster. Um, okay, man, you're tall. It, it pays to be a tall photographer. All right, because I'm always on ladders <laughs> or Apple boxes. Okay, yep, thank you. All right, it, it, it tilted down. Can we get it flat, flat on? Okay, so as you can see, what's happening now with Eric and he's adjusting the light. Um, as you can see, the head's right in the middle, right? The hottest portion of the light and the sweetest spot, obviously, is right in the middle. So that's where he's positioning the sweetest amount of light, okay, right at him onto his face, okay? So now what we're doing is we are angling the light straight on to him, which is like a slight three quarters, okay? I'm going to show you, and there's a purpose to why he's wearing a white shirt over, yeah? I want to show you the effects of what white does. All right, very quickly, here we go, one, two. Oh, flash, sorry. Hang on. Did that come in? One second. No, give me five, please. Thank you. Okay, let's move it feeding. Okay, one second. Let me feed it again. Sorry. Yep, yeah, let's switch it on. Thank you. Cool. Oh. Yep, nice. Got it. Okay, Josh, here we go. Thank you. All right, just one moment, all right? Just let me focus. Looking good. Hold that. One, two. Cool. As you can see, I was just guiding him along. Yeah, one, two. Okay, so uh, obviously, hmm, okay, it's a lot brighter on my screen, just a little. Okay, so it is underexposed. It is underexposed, and I'm on 5.0. Okay, I've got 125F11. Okay, I'm working on F11 today. And it's on 5.0, middle mark. So what happens? Straight away, Eric, give me one stop. Let's go 6.0, please. Yes, please. Okay, Josh, looking good. Just lovely. Hold that. One, two, super. All right. Oh, one second. There you go. Nicely exposed, All right? Okay. So just looking at this, straight away you will see that this portion of his face is bright. Bright, All right? Okay. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just feather it, okay? But feathering, what happens when you feather? You will get, sorry, here we go, Josh, one more time. Hang in there, hold that, one, two. 
your background becomes darker. Right? Your background becomes darker, but your face doesn't burn no more. So what do you do? I want the background to, to look the way it, it did. It's kind of nice that way. You throw in a cutter. Bring in a cutter. Okay, you bring the cutter in. I'm just gonna squeeze it over there. All right, cool. Let's bring it right in here. Okay, so let's try and get rid of the, the, that slight overexposure on, well, it's actually not really overexposed. Let's give it a little bit of juice. Let's go to 6.5. Before you bring the cutter up, let's shoot one. Here we go, one, two, nice, hold that. That's also because my light's higher, so it's not burning his shirt so much there. His shirt's burning, right? So let's do this. We'll bring this up. Okay, let's raise it. Raise it, okay, pull it back. That's good. All right, let's just stay there. Super. Come forward a bit. Okay, cool. Higher. All right. That's a very different result. Obviously, the further away is softer, the closer is harder. Yeah, let's raise it up a little bit more, please. Uh, too much? Lower? Hold that. Let's try that. That's a nice soft fade in the light. Okay, here we go one more time. Super. Nice. Soft smiles, Josh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice. Lovely. Okay. Where is that? There you go. So you see your eye is being drawn into his face now, right? It's not so white. Okay. And then we can bring another cutter in very simply. Uh, let's do this. Let's hand, hand hold it. Let's bring it in on that side. You have to stand there. Okay, Josh. Cool. Okay, let's bring this up to cut the edge of his face. Yeah. Let's come right in here. Mm -hmm. This cutter is a bit too big for me right now, right? Uh, because obviously it's not reaching the background the way I want it to be, but yeah, we can still get away with it. We, I usually have smaller cutters, like a, we call it a finger. It's a slim cutter that will just go right in there and that will shade the side of the face, okay? So what I'm doing here with that other cutter is to shade that side of the face that will give me this. Okay, coming up, yeah, just slightly more shaded, but, but that means a little bit dimmer. So I just bring up another half stop, so I'm now up to 7.0 on the pack. All right, so here we go, one, two. So sorry. I'm creating a lot of that, right? Sorry, Dylan, I'll bring it up. Okay, better. Yeah, see? All right, compare this and this. Oh, hang on, how do I compare that? Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, forget it. So just look at this and this, for example. All right? You see the difference? Yeah? So you get a lot more attention drawn to the face, which is the most important thing to me when you're doing a portrait especially. Okay, now, for enough with cutters. Let's take off the white T-shirt. Okay. All right. Let's bring that down. Bring this down. Let's... Uh, you can chill out for a minute. Let's have Emma. All right, Josh, thank you for now. Uh, Emma, here we go. All right. Thank you, Emma. Okay, obviously different faces, different um, boys and girls, very, very different approach. Um, all right, so I want to share with you a little bit about colors now. I think colors could be very interesting. I want to get a softer light on her, a lot softer. So let's go really, really close. Okay, as you can see now, I'm going really close, right up there, right up there. Okay, cool. And then, yeah, that's kind of nice. That's great. Cool. Bring it down a bit so that I can get a nice amount of lower. Uh huh. Good. Hold, hold that. Cool. Come around a bit. All right. Cool. 
Nice. Okay. So, obviously, when you talk about colors, uh, most photographers will put gels. Right? That's one way. Yeah, that's one way. But colored paper or colored boards is another very, very subtle way of creating color as well. Right? So, what, what I'm going to do right now, uh, if you can come. Okay, just hold this here. All right, I'm using colored reflectors. Right? Okay, so without, let's do it without first. Sorry. All right, obviously, exposure is going to be blown. Let's, go, let's do a baseline again. Eric, baseline, sorry. Okay, I'm. Uh, all righty, that's great. Okay, just give me a moment. I'm focusing. Super. One, two. Soft smiles. Nice. Love that. Oops, that didn't fire properly. One more time. Here we go. One, two. Nice. Lovely. So that's a, that's a wrong, wrong exposure. So that's 5.0. Okay, so it's looking a bit dark. Let's bring it up to 6. Yep, here we go. Nice one. One more time. One, two. Soft smiles. Nice. Love. Cool. And, yep. Mm, 6. Point, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. Love that. Stay there. Okay. That's, that's a nice, clean shot with a softbox, right? Okay, let's put in a coloured board. Come a lot closer to, the, to, to, to her, the board. A little bit more. Come to me. Come to me. Closer. Nice. Stay there. Here we go. Chin down. Nice. Here we go. One, two, and love. All right, straight away, what you get is... It looked like I put a light there, didn't I? With a, with a coloured gel, didn't it? But it's a soft light, right? Because it's a reflected light. Let's try yellow. Let's try red. Any, any amount of colour, just go to a craft shop. <laughs> Alright, here we go. One, two. Bam, right? You get a coolish light. I mean, uh, a very warmish light. Here we get a nice red hot light. Looking good. Very interesting. Just simply with one light and a board, a couple of coloured boards. Right? And that's just placing it on the opposite end. I could very easily give it give a blue one again. Ideally, this should be on boards, okay? not so flimsy, right? so the system can hold it from just one end. But if you have it here, I can wrap. I can wrap the bottom. Yeah, that's kind of cool as well. Okay, wrapping it. Okay, here we go. Nice, nice. Let me come a little bit closer. Because you can see Eric in the shot. One, two. Nice. Super. Let's try that. So you get a little bit of wrap coming right under as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or let's go with two colors. <laughs> All right. Let's up it. Okay. Let's up it. Let's hold that. Can you find a way? <laughs> All right. Uh, Craig, you mind helping? Thank. Oh, you're good. He's okay. Yeah. Uh, kind of. Maybe Craig, if you can help one with one. You help with the red. You just go flat blue. Flat blue. Red, blue, nice. There we go. Thank you. Cool, buddy. Thank you. Lovely. One, two. No one's got to know you only got one light. <laughs> For example. Oh, that's cool. Refreshing. Right? And the fact that you have two color, three colors now, you got that white balance flash. You have that red and you have that blue. So what happens? Take it into Photoshop play with the curve, you would create a fourth colour, a fifth colour. And it just gets really organic that way. Very, very fun, right? Okay, so that's uh, one way to do colours. Okay, so um, let's play with our second setting. Let's swap it over to the clamshell. Cool. Thanks, bro. Okay, while we swap over, any questions? Say again. Sure, I can do that. But when you have a smaller softbox, you get a harder light. Yeah. Right? I want to retain the softness. That's why I have a big softbox, but I still am able to cut and have that real estate, so to speak. Sh 
Yep, sometimes, sometimes you can do that. That's very directional. But, but if you, have, you, you happen to have one light, for example, and you want this one light to get to the background, right? If you have a grid, that's it, right? You put it on and the background goes dark straight away. So uh, it's, it's kind of nice to have a big box and you can start cutting it and then create and sculpting the light. Because when you have things that are fixed straight from the manufacturer, somehow you use it in that way only. You know what I mean? Sort of, yeah. But no wrong. Mix it up. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Any other questions? No. Yeah. Okay, what, what, what we're doing here is a clamshell lighting. Um, in the 80s, 90s, it's like the default fashion lighting. It comes in front, right? You, you will get one softbox here, another softbox here, straight on. Pow, clean, beauty. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a retro lighting setup. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I love this, this light compared to having one softbox flat on, I have two softboxes, big ones, generally this size, yeah? And I do it in a clamshell. With this, I can tell you this is the most beautiful light that will work with just about everybody. It will make anybody look good because I, can, I have a light coming from the top and a light coming from the bottom to get rid of all the shadows because on our faces, especially Caucasian faces, Asians, we're all flat. <laughs> You have a lot of deep set eyes and sharp noses, and that creates a lot of shadows. <laughs> a lot of shadows. The bottom light fills it in so beautifully that you know, wrinkles and stuff just whoop, disappears. Okay, so um, here, let's give it a try. All right, let's, um, let's bring in um, Josh, yeah? Thank you. Um, let's sit the other way around so that I can have your hands up and like that. Yeah, straddle it, straddle it, yeah. Cool, and then put your hands up. Yeah, that's nice. All right, let's bring the camera down. Okay. Uh, let's get the light a little closer. Yeah, hands down. Five, please, thank you. All right, yeah. Cool, that's beautiful. Can we... Come around a little bit more. So I'm working with the Pro Photo Pro Heads and Pro Pack. All right, uh, long time user of Pro Photo, love the accessories. Come a lot closer, please. Some more. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Love the accessories that they have. That's their strength. They allow the photographer to shape light literally. Uh, all right, let's try that. Okay, maybe let's do one without your hands up first for now. Lovely. Okay, lean in forward a little bit. Hunch forward a little bit. That's nice. Very nice. Very, very nice. Let's change the crop. Let's go this way. All right. Okay, just a second, Josh. I'm framing, okay? Yeah, hold that. Looking great. Okay, now we're on baseline. Here we go. One, two. Love that. Okay. 5.0, okay, let's go top light. Uh, you know what, both lights, let's go 6.5. Uh, no, 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 six. It's actually really nice on the screen. But there, let's just shoot it for projector. Okay, I'm going to shoot it for projector so you get to see slightly better exposure on the projector, okay? Here we go, one, two. Yeah, that's nice, hold that. Nice, Josh. Okay, lovely. All right, what, what happens here is I can finesse the bottom light, right? I can feather the bottom light by a half stop down, by a half stop down to just give a little kick. But you can see that there's this amazing soft light that envelopes, that digs right in to the underside of his eye here. And look at that beautiful catch light, yeah? So it really gets to the underside 
right there, right? Okay, it gets right under the chin. You can never get that with one softbox. It would never feed in. You know what I mean? It doesn't feed right in. Whereas when you have two, you can vary the exposure of the bottom light with the power settings. That's a, what's that now? 6 inches, 5.5 in the bottom. Okay, let's try a slightly weaker down light. One, two. Okay, here we go. Slightly weaker down light. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. The, you, no. the bottom light went. This is top. This is top. Yeah, correct. Huh? So you choose that one. No, 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 no. That's no, I need a, yeah, six. Yeah. And then I need five. Yeah. Let's go 5.0. Sorry, we mixed up the cables. Here we go. Nice, Josh. Lovely. Let's go back to the same pose. Thanks. Super. One, two. Nice. Okay, now I'm just bringing the top light more, and you can see his his wrinkles and lines are starting to form, right? Okay, that would pretty much behave what a single softbox would do. And if I, if I cut it down, or I just get rid of the bottom light, switch it off, take it off, unplug it, bottom light, bottom, change it. Yeah, okay? So imagine this is one light, okay? Imagine this is one light. Cool, Eric, hold it for me, just hold it for me. Yeah, that's good. Imagine this is one light, okay? One, two, hold that. Very nice, hold. Um, brighter, slightly brighter, six. Point five, yeah, cool. Here we go, one, two. All right, see the difference? Yeah, that's one soft box. Can you see? It doesn't dig in from the under. All right, and then compare it with the beautiful light I had. Look at that. Just nice and soft and wraps. And so that's really sexy to me. And this light would make any skin tone, any face shape, any age look pretty amazing. This is the most flattering light. Celebrities love this setup. <laughs> okay. All right, so this is your typical portrait approach. Okay. So now let's swap it over. Let's have, um, thanks, Josh. Yeah, I want to swing it more to the back. Get the. I'll move this for you. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Edging, edging. Cool. Okay. All right. So switch it back on. The bottom. Switch it back on. The bottom. Right? Oh, okay. Cool. Put the sandbag on. Okay, now I'm just swiveling the light. All right. Now, um, when I work in the studio, I draw imaginary lines. All right. So there's a grid. There's a grid in my studio, in my head. So my camera is one line. The model is another line. And that's, that becomes a cross. Then I'll draw equal lines down the and like that. So what happens is I have symmetry. If, if I do have two lights from the back as kickers, right, I will always do one side and the other side is echoed down the same line. I will step back and I will go, okay, that light higher, little bit. Uh, 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 uh. When you have a grid in your head, you minimize all the variations and the, the, the small little difference when your light's too far, too near because you're both of your lights are at different positions, so to speak. Okay, so this is me shooting from the mid-tones. Can you see? My camera is right into the mid-tone. The mid-tone is where her nose bridge is. The transition from highlight to mid-tone and shadow. Right? So that's a fall-off. Highlight, mid-tone, shadow. How fast it falls off is how hard the light is and how soft the light is. Right? Okay? So this would give me a more sculptural... Uh, look to her face. The thing is, we do not have a white reflector, do we? No. Okay, you know what? Let's take the soft box out. Handheld the soft box. Okay. In photography, you tend to be a MacGyver <laughs> sometimes. You know, you work with what you have, or I might just take this whole tablecloth and use it as a reflector. 
But that's a lovely... No, no, just take off the head, bro. So you don't have to bring the wire. Okay, so this is just a reflector, okay? Very expensive reflector. Here we go. I'm going to use it to reflect some light back into her. But before that happens, wait. I need to reposition this light. Okay, I'm going to just position this a little bit more off. So I don't get so much light on her. Mm -hmm. okay. Cool. Lovely. Nice. Interesting. A little bit that way. Super. No back. It's going to burn. Nice. Okay. Then we'll have my Octa reflector. First time I'm doing this. Okay, I'm going to use this as a reflector, okay? It's going to reflect back and fill in the shadows for me. So, same thing. What's the setting? Five? Five. Let's do a baseline again. Baseline five. Cool. Lovely. This one can get closer. Some more. Oh, stop. Stay there. Good. All right. If you can just lean forward and just put your hands and yeah, lean a little bit more forward. That's nice. Emma. Look at me. Turn your head a little bit to me. Nice. Super. Here we go. One, two. Good. All right. One second. Oh, very dark. Okay. So what happens? Let's go um, 6.5. Okay, cool. All right, here we go. Focus in, that's beautiful. Chin down a little. Nice, Emma. Soft smiles. Nice. Love that. Okay. All right. A little bit more sculptural. It's a lot better here. Maybe let's go a lot more. I'm going one stop. So I'm now at 7.5. I'm building my light, all right? Okay, building my light. Here we go. One, two. Cool. Pop. Okay, it's going to burn. All right, it's going to burn, but that's really nice because I have this really nice wrap again. And I'm shooting in the mid tones that gives her a lot of sculpting. Okay, I would ideally love this setup to be higher because the bottom light is a little too low right now. Ideally, this line, as you can see where the two soft boxes meet, should be in the middle of her face. <laughs> I'm quite far off. I, I don't have a... Actually, we, could, we can angle it. We can angle it. Come, let's try that. Raise this up higher. There you go. Spin it. Okay, nice. Lock. This one spin. So, you know, you got, you, you got to be kind of inventive as a, you know, and uh, with a photographer, I mean, um, being a photographer sometimes in the studio because uh, you got to work with what you have. And that brings the line up. Yay! Super. Yes. So I like to angle it more because I don't want it to spill on her face so much. Okay. And then this one, reflector, nice. Nice and hard, right, right up there. But here, I'm doing a double bounce kind of thing. And the spill of the light is also lighting her. All right? Okay, here we go. One, two. Very nice. All righty. All righty. Ah, much better. Much better. Much softer. Yeah? Okay? Of course, it would be great to have another reflector here. Um, let's throw this in. I would usually like white, okay? But yeah, it's okay, I can use the silver here. Sorry. The... Okay. <laughs> cool. That's where the ball comes. <laughs> That's where the ball comes. All right, sorry, I'm gonna block you a bit. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Obviously, the distance of this reflector is going to matter, but it's going to be nice. Here we go. Nice, Emma. One, two. Super. And uh, opens up a, a little, or I can go right up and edge her hair. What? 
whatever amount of light I can get, it becomes an edge. There we go. Lovely. Very nice, Emma. There we go. One, two. Super. Oops, it's moving. <laughs> it's moving towards you. <laughs> it was like. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let me reposition this. Sorry. I usually have a lot more assistance. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, I want it closer. Hang on. That's where I will walk into it. There we go. I'm just looking at the shine in her hair. She's got beautiful hair. Let's just bring the shine in. There we go. One, two. Lovely smile. Go for it. One, two. Nice. There. Oh, that. It's a soft kick right into the hair. You can see it a lot better here. I'll expose one for the screen. I'll expose one for the projector. Okay, here we go. One more time. Soft, soft. One, two. Good. Let it go over her. That's it. Yeah? Pretty burnt, but, <laughs> but just, uh, so that you can see uh, for the projector. Yeah? Super. Any questions so far? How are we doing? Yes, please. I love questions. Uh, right now, as in this setup? Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. You can do that. I, occasionally, I do that. But I would say the reflector should be a silver. So you get as strong a light as possible. Ideally, it should be the same ratio, uh, which means if this is 5.0, this should be 5.0 or half a stop, 4.5. Right? A reflector a silver will probably give you 4 or less, 3.5 or something. But, uh, or a mirror. <laughs> that would be double, right? A really strong, solid, big mirror. That would be, but yeah. So that's another way of doing it. Yeah, but it would, it would yield really interesting results with, um, based on how you angle your light as well, right? Obviously, the, 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 the pitch of this would affect how much it hits whatever's here and how it pushes out because it goes down and out. Uh, that's why I say I like breaking light because light doesn't have to always go straight. <laughs> right? As we all know, science, you can't beat that. It travels straight, but yeah, we can weave in and out of it. I think that's the beauty of light and how... Um, uh, because for me, it's perhaps a pet peeve of mine. I hate looking at a picture and, it, and there's, it's so obviously lit with one softbox, kind of. <laughs> because it's been done to death, right? I want to do something different. Yeah, so to speak. Super. Um, anybody would like to try, shoot something? I, 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 I still have 20 minutes, so I'm done. <laughs> um, questions? The color is interesting, isn't it? That, 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 that color bit, yeah? Yeah, I, just, um, I love doing that. Sometimes what I even do is I roll out an entire, an entire roll of background paper. So for example, I have a top light. I'll throw a top light, and then I'll, I'll roll out a big piece of red paper, and the hue from that comes down. It looks like I've got red light coming from below. A nice, soft red light, yeah? Pink. Try doing a pink gel coming from a light. You can never do it. Almost. Well, kind of. But the pink, you can never quite get it. Right? But if you put a piece of pink paper, it literally gives you a lovely pink hue. A very subtle, soft hue, which you can never replicate with a pink gel. Yeah, so that's really cool. I love that. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, what I do is um, I have this routine every day when my wife puts my daughter to sleep at 7 p.m. 
I will have time alone for an hour or so, where I will just spend my time at the computer doing all kinds of research and be looking at different things. And in this hour, I will be looking at all kinds of visuals. And whatever I see, I pull straight away. I don't remember it, I pull it. I capture it, put it into a folder. I've got very specific folders in this idea folder, which have subcategories, beauty, black and white, headshots, group, um, whatever, 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 whatever. You know, you know what I mean? So whenever I need anything, it just goes, I just go straight to that folder and I can react fast, as opposed to I got a job and then I have to start looking for visuals. I have this bank of visuals that I'm drawn to and it just holds there. And it's years and years of pictures, thousands, thousands of pictures. Okay. Okay. Well, to be honest, um, the one big difference I would say, if you're lighting an object, if say for example, just straight off a softbox, right? Yeah. If you're lighting an object, the fabric of the softbox, if it's a reflected object, you might see the the folds of the softbox. So if it's an object, I would reckon a perspex, a white perspex, acrylic perspex would be a very good, solid, seamless, creaseless light source, right? Or a diffusion uh, roll, which is a roll and you create a tent and you can light through and that becomes a very seamless softbox. Softboxes are great, but they are built for convenience packing and traveling and, you know, but they are great for portraits. But if you're talking about product, they would not give the best highlight, I mean, a reflection. You'll be, you know, you will get that undulation. You know what I mean? You see this? You often see it in a reflection. If it's a watch, a bottle, a plate, etc. Yeah. Totally, yeah. Yep. Um, buy a piece of white acrylic that's a bit translucent, right? Cut into different sizes. That becomes the frame of your softbox, right? And then you can have your softbox behind it, right up against it. That becomes a flat surface that will give a very clean white light with no creases. That's what I would do. That's the cheapest way. Of course, they sell specialized soft boxes made of acrylic and hard. You know, but those are tens of thousands of bucks for very specialized product photography. Yeah, but the cheapest, most doable way to, is to get an acrylic. Or get a diffusion roll, right? A roll of diffusion paper. And then you could, you could just slop it into a C-stand, slide it in and pull it out. Right? And then this is a solid, uh, right? and you throw a light behind it, that becomes a very clean surface to throw a soft light, for example. Yeah. Okay, maybe what I can do, I can share this with you. Cool. I can share this with you. Yeah. Super. So, um, evolution, right? Uh, maybe we can off this. I, um, as a commercial photographer, I, I, I receive a lot of layouts, visuals, more often than not, that comes in the form of a sketch or a composited picture. So with this, it's my job to realize it, so to speak. So my favorite is obviously receiving a sketch primarily because uh, clients won't be too fixated on uh, an actual visual with actual photography. So this is a visual that the art director, when finding Getty and whatever, and cut it up 
to put together this visual. And what happens? Clients will then be fixated upon the visual, which is so wrong because in a photographic visual, you have lighting, you have color and stuff. It forces the client to want to like something. Right, so much so that when I do the actual, I have very little wiggle room to do creatively what I can do. So, you know, they, they were so fixated on, on you know, the, the guy wearing that hat in that particular look, and it doesn't allow me to have stylistic uh, opinions anymore, right? So, but we do our best, yeah? So love sketches because it allows, but even sketches, I would much prefer a black and white sketch as opposed to a colored sketch. So um, here you can see that I love black and white sketches. Love it because then I get to have my colors and interpret it the way I want it to be. I can have it pink, I can have it purple or whatsoever, right? Again, black and white sketch allows me to play the mood, the setting of the set. So I get to create a bluish tint in the background, a warmish tint on her. That gives a nice warm, cool effect to the picture. But imagine some visualizer, not even a creative director or art director, who is drawing a sketch, colors it. He was the one who created the image, even before the photographer or the creatives did it which is kind of wrong, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because visualizers are very, very junior. So the client is buying into a very junior aesthetic as opposed to creative directors, art directors, and photographers' aesthetics, which are a lot more mature, so to speak, right? So that, as a photographer, I try to, to, especially a commercial photographer, I try to bring a little bit of myself into every image. So this is an ad for <laughs> premature ejaculation. It's actually an ad for Australia. Um, so the visual was, you know, acro yoga in bed, last, lasting longer and whatever. And I looked at the visual, obviously it's composited visual, and I thought, it's kind of dark, you know, it looks like they're doing things in secret and it looks like a dungeon. And <laughs> <laughs> with curtains closed, it's kind of moody, and, and that's not what I envision. I want it to be light and bright and, you know, give people that hope. And <laughs> so my idea was to create this window with bright light streaming in and, you know, glow and, and a nice warm setting. So, so you know, and the way he craters her, you know, she craters his, his face and stuff like that. So as a photographer, uh, I... It's, it's my little signature, my stamp to elevate the creative visuals, yeah? Again, a composite for Singapore's Changi Airport by the client, uh, by the agency. And then here's the... Sometimes visuals don't happen exactly the way they do on sets. Uh, after angling the top shot and wide angle, it doesn't look right because these two mother and father are supposed to be celebrities and the kid's head was so big that the client didn't like it at all. So we had to change tactics and shoot them straight on. Yeah. It's a sketch for a home delivery uh, thing. So... Yeah, my touch was the God's rays. I love flares in my picture. If you look at my photography, there's a lot of flares and light and stuff. To be honest, I should, I, I should live in Australia. The light's so beautiful. <laughs> um, another sketch. So it's a really, really fun campaign to work on. Um, this is a computer game company, so it's a lot of C uh, CG. 
So as a uh, photographer, most of my images are retouched by professional retouchers, primarily because I would rather be shooting than retouching. Uh, although I'm pretty decent at retouching. Um, I enjoy it actually. I, I, I find it very therapeutic, retouching beauty faces. I love going into the details and going tuk, 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 and just creating perfect skin. So therapeutic. So beauty is something I do myself. I, I love doing that. But stuff like that, clipping and it, hair and stuff, oh, I'll leave it to somebody. One of my most favorite campaigns, uh, babies. So as you can see, uh, I have a lot at my disposal. A bit, you know, a black and white sketch. I, uh, it just goes boom. What can I do? What can I do? You know. So I created this again with my light flare and ah, right. So I love it. I think uh, it adds to the um, the depth of the picture, right? And um, this. I wanted to create that arena setting with the, with the, with the teddy bear surrounding him. Uh, quite a composite of a shot. Um, the cape, the left hand, the right leg was different shots. <laughs> yes? Well, it starts with a brief. It starts with me giving them enough composites. So if anything, more often than not, if I'm going to do this shot, my camera is on a lock off, always on a lock off, right? It's locked, sandbagged, tightened, never moves, OK? After shooting the baby, I will remove the baby and shoot a clean plate so that he has information of what's behind the baby, behind the head, exactly behind the head, just in case we want to move the baby left or right. He has that information. So in commercial shoots, I always do plates. So the more I give him, the better a job he can do. Yes? For sure. Yeah, no, I always get, if it's, a, if it's a stock composite, for example, you know, I, I can't fly to Australia and shoot, you know, in the Darling Harbour, for example, I would find the stock image first, confirm that, have it on set, and light it from there. Yeah, it, so I will see the brightest portion of the sky is coming from the right, right? So I'll position my main light on the right behind my model, and then I'll light it from there. So it's always knowing that, because you know, it's the worst thing to shoot something and then after thought, it becomes an after thought, then lighting is not going to match. For sure, for sure, always. Um, I, I tend to gel a lot of my lights because straight out flash, it's just too white, too cool, too, too nothing. You know, it's nice to always just throw it off with a little bit of CTB or CTO. Just a very slight quarter, so that this light is a quarter bright uh, blue, this light is a quarter warm. There's that mix, and it becomes this mm, <laughs> creamy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, 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 it becomes creamy. So, like this um, ad I did for, for Vietnam, um, uh, it's a fashion mall. So, the visual obviously is just cut and paste. But I looked at it and I said, yeah, it's kind of static, it's kind of boring. The products coming out of a champagne bottle looks very fake. Uh, let's get some movement into the shot. Um, so my idea was to create some streaks of light so that it feels like they are streaking in and it feels like it's moving. And then adding, adding the, 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 the slow shutter and getting the model to move while I move my camera gives me all this interesting, oops, sorry. Gives me all this interesting. Uh, sorry, uh, can you see that? that that curves? And you see in her, even the choice of the outfit with the sequence, you get all these curves, which adds to it, and the bouquet adds to the depth of the picture. Yeah. All right, that's it. I think. Uh, sorry, that's another show altogether. <laughs> so um, just a second. Where's my mouse? Sorry. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, that's my socials. If 
well, like, like, la, la, la. <laughs> um, email me if you have questions. I'll be really, really happy to, to uh, get to know you guys. Um, I'll be open for questions from here on or outside. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.